Hey guys, we are going to try to fly through this. Um, this is the first of several orientations with CPDC. This is considered our um, basic orientation for the first go round. This one's required by anyone who does anything in CPDC, whether it's work a regular job, come in as an interventionist. Um, the, this presentation discusses everything that we're required by law from licensure to tell you. So let's get started. First off, um, we are a campus laboratory school. We've been around 93 years, the oldest in the state. We started in 1929. So when using the wording to describe what we are here in the center, please make sure to call us the campus laboratory school or just a school. Um, please don't use the word daycare. That word is offensive and that's a different type of care than what we provide. All of our teachers here are highly qualified. We do specific lesson plans based on the state learning standards. We use conscious discipline and several other things that just takes us a step above um, what a traditional child care center would provide. We are very excited about this school year and the developmentally appropriate practices and things that we've learned over the past summer. We spent a lot of time training and we can't wait to share those with you in future sessions. So all adults, visitors, volunteers, anyone who is coming in the center and going in a classroom, we must have your 121 form and an application. Please, when you're in the classroom, you are not allowed to take any videos or photos of our children. Be discreet. We don't talk about kids, family, staff, any of our business outside of the center. We consider this a family environment and we don't go behind our backs talking about folks. That's just not professional. The biggest thing that will keep everyone happy is if you jump in when you see a need. If you see a teacher struggling with one child, go handle the rest of the children while she's building a relationship and figuring out what to do with that one. I'm going to say this a lot in this presentation, but watch your beverages and food. We must have things that they're brought in. They have to be in a Tarvis tumbler type Yeti cup or something. You cannot go by Starbucks and bring in your beautiful drink because that's not okay. Um, because of the obesity problem in Mississippi, licensure has put their foot down on this. You can't come in with a McDonald's bag or Chick-fil-A bag and go eat in front of our kids. It's not allowed. Keep any items, purses, bags, phones, all that out of the reach of kids. In some of the classrooms, there are new cabinets and there are some lock boxes and things in there that you can use but they must be up and out of reach of children at all times. We have volunteer time logs that will be in the hallway on, in a binder. All staff that are here um, and Jumpstart members will be able to log in and out using the Brightwell app. If you don't know what to do in the classroom, the biggest thing is just to keep to the schedule and routine of the classroom. That's not an option. That's also mandatory for licensure. Okay. This one hour orientation that we're going through today is also mandatory by licensure. So first things first, the best door to get in is the door that faces faculty apartments. There's a doorbell there. Um, we can give you the code to get in. That's just the easiest way. Um, when you need to use the other door and ring the doorbell and don't have access, that's just one person you're pulling out of a classroom to come let you in. So please walk around and use the code to that door. You can get your ID card activated. If your ID card is not activated, you may go by the post or the police station on campus and they will activate your MUW student ID card. The first day you'll report here to us and we will go through the first few weeks of letting you work in classrooms and kind of find your niche and your need and your people. Um, one of the biggest things is to make sure you download GroupMe. GroupMe is not option. It is mandatory for everyone who works in the CPDC. Masks are not required at this moment in time. Health checks, however, are required. If you've got fever, you've had fever within 48 hours, tummy issues, any of that, stay away. We don't want your germs. Um, you will eventually be assigned classrooms, but for the first few weeks, we'll let you kind of find your people. We have absolute zero tolerance um, for cell phones, earbuds, Apple watches, any of that. If you're looking at a watch or you're looking at a, um, a phone, any of that, you are not paying attention to my children and that is not legal. Name tags are required at all times. Everyone will have a badge and ID card like this. If you're coming in from a school district or somewhere else, you can just wear your school ID and that's fine as well. Um, we have specific requirements that we'll go over today for our volunteers, student staff, lead teachers. The lead teachers have a, a lot of requirements that our student staff may not understand, and that's okay. 
please feel open and free to ask and talk to them about what's going on in the classroom. Dress code. We've had some problems with this um, as the world goes more casual and we come out of COVID. Covered, absolutely the most important. Um, please remember this is a professional environment. Um, you cannot show your midriff. You cannot wear jeans with so many holes in them that they have a ton of rips and tears. Body should be covered from shoulders um, to your knee. That means that um, the sports bra top type tops, um, shorts, any of that, they need to be your main minimum fingertip. And when I'm talking about shorts, I'm not talking about athletic legging workout type shorts. I'm talking about shorts that are not attached skin type to your body. Um, if you would wear it to the gym, it is probably not appropriate in this building. Workouts, hike leggings with tight tops, all that kind of thing, save it for the gym. Your midriff should not be showing. I know that's the trend right now, and I'm so sorry, but that is not appropriate for this environment. If you wear dresses or skirts or things like that, that's fine, but make sure you put on um, some of those athletic shorts that you can't wear as a single outfit underneath that skirt. Um, kids are going to be off in your business, and you're going to be up and down off the ground because that's where we want you to be playing with children. Be professional and presentable, but be comfortable. If you wouldn't wear it up in church on a Wednesday night, you don't need to be wearing it here. Um, we're going to use lots of bleach, so make sure if it is something um, that it will likely get something with spots on it. We suggest that old t-shirts are great um, if they're long enough to go over leggings that hide your booty, that's fine. But please remember, this is not the gym. Please dress appropriately for the environment. We are teachers. We need to dress as such. Basic health. Um, we do a ton of hand washing here throughout the day. There are notes everywhere on when this should happen. Playing in centers before we eat, when we come inside, when we go outside. If in doubt, we should be hand washing. There's a hand washing song and all our classrooms now have these really cool timers so that the kids know how long. That's a great thing for student workers to help with is hand washing and making sure they're hand washing to the specific amount of time. We check diapers and do potty a minimum of every two hours. We have a ton of indoor outdoor safety requirements that are gonna be required for you to help us maintain. There are new yellow binders within every classroom. And within those binders, it's gonna have things like who has your allergies, who's allowed to make pictures, all those things will be in the binders. Um, handling of storage has hazardous materials. We have discussed that. One of the things with that are things like vomit. We have some of these sawdust type things to sweep that up and throw it in the garbage. When it comes to things like bowel movements, parents don't like this, but this is a licensure requirement. We cannot wash underwear and things out here that have had um, soil bowel movements. You can take the um, bowel movement and drop it into the toilet and flush it and just double, triple bag it, whatever you got to do and send them home. We are not allowed to put any of those items in our washing machine for cross-contamination. Um, when it comes to transportation and field trip safety, there are certain ratios that we require if you're going to take the buggy with the kids out. One, don't do that in the afternoon from like 3.30 on. Parents will start picking up kids and their kids aren't in the building and they're ready to go by the end of the day. Y'all know that feeling. So we don't do field trips, walking trips, any of that at the end of the day. Two, if we do go out of the building with children, whether we're taking them over to the gym or to tots or just on a walking trip or we're going caroling or whatever that might be, we have different ratio requirements that ups the number of adults we have to have with children. So please be mindful of that. We also have to talk about SIDS prevention, shaken baby syndrome. We don't do infants here. So that's not something that is um, something we necessarily worry about, but we do have some some SIDS prevention as far as um, laying children on their back and how to be careful with blankets, not to cover their face, all those type of things. Preventing and managing infectious diseases. We are required to turn in anything infectious um, if we receive so many cases to our licensure agent. That happens with COVID, that happens with flu, with all the things. So we really have to be careful and diligent on cleaning and disinfecting and making sure that we are having the safest environment possible for our children. We have a great deal of mini food allergies this year. We have gone completely nut free. That means there's no almond milk. We don't allow peanut butter. 
do not bring any of those things in our building because we have some serious allergies. In saying that, we've got some children who are also asthmatic and use inhalers, and we have some children um, that use EpiPens this year. We have a great many allergies. Please work with directly with your lead teacher on discussing the sheet that's in their yellow binder that says their, the allergies that are in their classroom and how we maintain that, where the EpiPens are stored, where their inhalers are stored, who we contact, what we do in an emergency, all those kind of things. Um, go over that directly with your classroom instructor. Medication administration. We are very specific on medication in our building too. Medication is only allowed to be administered by benefited employees of MUW. That means my four lead teachers and myself are the only ones who've been trained on how to administer medication, EpiPens, asthma medication, all those things. We also do not allow like Tylenol or anything like that. That is an over-the-counter. It must be in a specific labeled direct from the uh, pharmacist bottle for us to be able to have it on the premises. Emergency and disaster plans. We, being on a university campus, have very, very specific emergency disaster plans. We will go through these in the next few weeks as we're hired on. Our fire drills, um, our tornado drill, as well as our active shooter safe place drill. We have very specific plans with those. Fire goes out both ends of the building and we meet at the corner of the playground and the stop sign on this side. Um, when it comes to tornado, the two older classes go in the bathrooms in the threes and fours, and the ones and twos go down to the adult bathroom on this side of the hall. For active shooter, we also have a safe place and safe place plan that are very detailed for those. I'm not going to go into those on this since it's posted online, um, but we will go through that here. Our philosophy on that, one, licensure requires us to practice those once a month. Two, the more we practice them with our children, the less scary they are in the moment and the more efficient we are at moving quickly. Um, so just be prepared and know that uh, we will be practicing those as the year starts. Anytime you hear that first Wednesday um, tornado drill, we will absolutely practice that. And then typically after that, we go straight into the other drills as well. Okay, our main job here, of course, is to keep the kids safe and have fun. Um, our biggest philosophy with early childhood is that education is play. Playing is learning at this age. So we need anyone that comes in to speak up if they see something that makes you uncomfortable or you don't understand or you have a better solution. There are some things that we're not going to change because they're not within our philosophy. Clip charts. You can go find all the research you want online about why that is not a good idea, especially in early childhood. Time out. There's a whole bunch of research on that online. All those kind of things don't fit in our philosophy, but I'll be glad to direct you in places that can help you understand that in a better way. Now, if it's something like you witnessed um, a teacher spending this much time in the bathroom with their children so her kids weren't supervised, speak up on that. I don't always see everything. Um, our leads don't always see everything. So if you see a better solution or something else that you think can help us, by all means, speak up. Classroom clean and organized. Um, kids can't learn in a messy environment. We've got to make sure we are helping the lead teacher with everything. And that goes straight into supporting the lead teacher. We're going to go into our main jobs, but one of our current workers had a great suggestion. Um, the thought is that lead teachers should handle everything academic, developmental going on in the classroom, and the aides and assistants should be the support role and handle the things that are not academic the cleaning and, and the diapering and the bathroom and all that and leave um, the teacher to be able to, to thoroughly teach and do what she needs to do. So that's a very important thing as we're going into this next phase. So one of the most important things you can do for the teacher is to be a shadow for a kid that either has special needs or just has a hard time engaging um, that is a big deal for all our teachers. Right now, we have a lot of kids that are new and a whole lot of kids that are new to being in a group environment. Group environments are very different than grandma and mama keep them at home. And you, if you're a parent or you've got young siblings, you know this, it's a lot easier sometimes to do everything for them and not have the same kind of expectations. When a group environment They've got to learn to wipe their own nose. They've got to learn to wipe their own bottom. They've got to learn how to wash their own hands and eat at the table and 
all the things. We cannot do it for them. We don't have time. We don't have that ability. Plus, if we're truly getting them ready for kindergarten, that main job is us being able to um, prepare them to be independent little humans. That's the whole goal of parenting. Prepare them for the real world later. And part of that is making sure they can handle and do things on their own. So as we go through this, the diaper changes and personal hygiene support, all that are great and wonderful ways you can support the teacher, but it's also supporting the child and the family at the same time. When you're having a diaper change, make sure you're using language and telling them what they're doing. When you're providing support in the bathroom, tell them about how you wipe and what to do and how we flush it, the flush it and all those kind of things so that they are setting themselves up to be able to handle that independently themselves. There is no world where we'll be able to keep the schedule and the routine perfectly, but we have a lot of kids who are having a difficult time right now back to school and getting into the routine. The best thing that we can do to make them feel secure, safe, and loved is to stick with the routine and schedule. That's also something that licensure requires. These aren't things that we've just made up. These are actual licensure requirements. So in saying that, let's go into some of these type things. Let's go talk about the lead teachers first. So the lead teachers are our primary mentors. They are the ones that are mentoring our student workers, our teacher intern, our observation hour students. Um, we have volunteers that come in from honors. We have volunteers that come in from MSMS. All these people fall under the umbrella of the lead teacher and the lead teacher is supposed to coach and mentor them and support them in that classroom. Now, because they have so many people coming in and out, it is very difficult to remember if you've told this person and this person and this person different things. That is why we've created the yellow binder system. The yellow binder will have all the information that you need in the classroom as an aide or a support personnel. They're going to tell you how to work in the center with the child. They're going to tell you what activities you can do to help. They're going to tell you how to help with bathroom needs. All those things are going to be able to find out the information in the lead yellow binder in the classroom, if, just in case the lead hasn't told you those things. The lead teacher's primary goal is to um, prepare and make sure we are teaching and conducting the academic and developmentally appropriate lessons. That includes small groups. That includes what's going into the centers. That includes creating the lesson plans, doing the assessments, all the big classroom picture. I think a lot of times our aides come in and they think, we don't have enough stuff in centers. This needs to be in the center. I need to pull out this dollhouse for the kids to do. Mm -mm. No, ma'am. <laughs> we have very specific guidelines on what goes in centers, what um, we are doing with our lessons, what goes into a specific center during a certain point in the year, what the kids are able to handle. We, and you're welcome to research this online too, we use um, Itters and Eckers, and we also use the class tool. We're also going through an AC accreditation. So we have a lot of things that are telling us exactly what should be where and when. Our curriculum does a good job at laying out what should be in centers, all those things. So aides in the classroom, go to your lead teacher and talk to them about the how and the why if you don't understand what's going on in the classroom. A lot of what we're finding out is that the student workers coming in or the teacher interns or whoever they may be really don't understand how centers work for teaching and learning. And so we've got some future sessions that are coming that hopefully will help you with that. One of the biggest things that the lead teacher role and the director role as well is that we are the primary communicator with the family. We are the first responder when it comes to communicating with family and teaching and telling the families what they need to know. We have very specific language that we need to use with families. We also might be watching for developmental concerns or we might have concerns already and we're preparing the notes, the anecdotal notes that we put together before we meet with the family on the whole package. Always, always, always talk to your lead teacher before you talk to a parent. None of my student workers or aides should be doing any kind of negative talk whatsoever with the parents and families. So, Part of this going into this that we're going to really try and work on this year is that our lead teachers should be handling all the major behaviors, and then they should coach you on how we're handling and supporting specific needs. We have a lot of very specific developmental behaviors and milestones that we're trying to help children reach. In saying that, a lot of our kids are behind in a lot of social emotional areas. That being said, we went through a complete 10-hour training this summer on conscious discipline. 
which doesn't sound like much, but we went and did the training online and then we went to Frog Street to do another 10 hours of, of coaching and training there. And we've learned a lot this summer. So please, please, please listen to your teacher and support them in what they're trying. For instance, we have a friend right now who gets very overwhelmed and over in the classroom. Our goal right now is to help him understand that he can go to these three different quiet spaces in the classroom to calm himself or to prepare himself to go to another center. That's something that myself and the lead teacher work on together. And then they're supposed to help the other folks in the classroom, the aides, the teacher assistants, all those people really work on helping us manage that kind of thing. Um, the lead teachers are setting the expectations for the classroom, the material, the flow, everything for the classroom. The lead teacher is responsible for that. I come in and coach the lead teacher. The lead teacher is supposed to coach and mentor any of the aides or interns. So we're going to talk about the teaching role in just a second. But the aides job, anyone who's coming in as work study or as a volunteer, your primary goal is to support the lead teacher. First and foremost, you should be handling all the non-academic items. You should be cleaning, putting out the meals helping in the bathroom, making sure hands are washed, diapering, all those things, the non-academic things should be handled by the support group in the classroom. Aides are also required to let the lead teachers go to lunch, let the lead teachers go work on lesson plans during their nap time. Whatever they need to do, the aides and assistants should be able to step in to let the lead do that. We talked about this just a little, but all assistants, work study, whoever, need to communicate with the lead before addressing a family. Anything that is addressed to the family should go through the lead teacher. If we're having a series of rough days and um, we're trying to hold back our conversations with the parents just yet until we get a little more information. Well, let's say part of what we're learning is back to this teaching role. Like we are trying to teach the child first and make sure the child understands what they should be doing, when and where, and as crazy as it sounds, sometimes it takes those 2,000 times to make it happen. But we have to teach before we correct. So part of that with the lead teacher and the lead teacher being the first responder with the families is that they know where we are in the teaching and coaching process with the child. So assistants do not need to be addressing families in any way other than, um, oh, we've had so much fun today. Don't say things like they've had a great day say things like they've had fun today or oh they really love the block center this afternoon stay away from language that says they had a great day they were in trouble a lot they said they didn't listen don't say things like that to families um stick to the basics of they had a lot of fun on the playground they really enjoyed popsicles this afternoon they really had fun building towers with me and block and that is it let the lead teachers navigate all the other language if a parent comes in in the afternoon and says, this happened in the morning and I need to know more about it, say something simple like, oh, I'll be glad to let the lead teacher know that you're going to speak with them in the morning about that. They've already gone home for the day, but I will message them to make sure they um, find time and have somebody in the room to be able to talk to you in the morning and leave it at that. Do not invent some story in your head about what happened. Let the lead teacher handle it later in the day. So again, support the lead teacher and their expectations for the children, their classroom commitments for the children, the flow of the classroom, all that is set by the lead teacher. Now, this bottom one is the most important thing we've learned with conscious discipline, and it's going to sound crazy because it's a complete mindset shift, but we have to shift ourselves into understanding and thinking that every role in that classroom, everything that we do is teachable. That kid needs to learn how to sit at the table and eat a meal with his friends. The child needs to learn how to drink out of a cup. The child needs to learn how to use the potty. They need to learn how to wash their hands. They need to learn how to play in a center. They need to learn how to talk to their friend. They need to learn how to, to communicate that they're upset about something. Every, every, every single moment in these classrooms is teachable. That's where we're going with this whole process of conscious discipline. That for now, we don't have any kids that should have consequences because they haven't been thoroughly taught how to handle themselves, what to do, how to handle how they're feeling and their emotions. There are no consequences right now in this moment in time. We give lots of choices. We do lots of, of words on, well, how did that make you feel? Well, then if you want this, say this. We're doing a lot of those kind of things. We've set up a conscious discipline board in the hallway that kind of gives a lot of scripts. We'll also be putting those scripts in the yellow binders in the classroom 
So you can really work through some of that. Now we'll go through a lot of this later because it's hard. Even for us that have practiced, I find myself all the time. We were dealing with a child the other day who was having a really difficult moment. First day back, overwhelmed, overstimulated, all over the place. And I was getting frustrated. The kid was frustrated. He was throwing things, destroying the classroom. And we have to remember in that moment, give ourselves some grace too. We don't always know what to do. Call in, back up, whatever. We'll figure it out together. But the biggest thing is give the kids grace, give yourself grace. And just remember that we are here to teach. Teaching is our first job. Consequences are not. Kids at this age don't need or understand consequences. All that is is stimulating fear. And we'll go into some of that later. But there's all this brain research out there that tells us and talks about our voice and our tone, how we give them consequences for things. Those things don't make sense at this age because all they do is incite fear. And that's not the part of the brain that they need to be using. That's not the part of the brain that does any learning. So we'll talk about that later. But for now, the biggest thing you can learn about this environment is that every item is teachable. Every role is teachable. Um, every one person, individual, child, teacher, me, everybody has room to grow and room to learn. So we are talking some about the teacher needs in this and what the teachers need from the aides and assistants. Make sure kids finish tasks before they move on. Make sure names don't work. Um, when they're big enough, they need to be writing their own name. We've got a lot of friends right now. We're working on how to play in centers. Even the little kids, the rooms can get destroyed in a heartbeat. Make sure that as an assistant, you are walking around the room, helping the kids that need help getting engaged stay in those centers. Then your second job is making sure that they're cleaning up the center before moving on. Now, until they learn all that, we really shouldn't be sitting down playing in centers with them unless we're trying to get them engaged in things. Our number one job right now is to make sure the kids know what they're supposed to be doing and their expectation. Stick into the classroom rules and commitments. Okay, simple. Things like if we don't, the kids aren't allowed to roll around on the carpet and horseplay. They shouldn't be allowed to roll around and horseplay on top of you. It doesn't work. <clears throat> make sure we're abiding by the rules just like the kids are. Staying engaged with the kids. <clears throat> don't wait on direction. Some activity need constant teacher supervision and instruction. So make sure we're focused on that for just a few minutes. So one of the things, too, that's most important is that if you're in doubt on what to do, engage in conversation with the kid. Every bit of what we do is encouraging language. Learning is language. Use open-ended questioning. That means instead of saying uh, something simple like a yes or no statement, say something like, did you like it? Tell me what you were doing. Explain to me what you're building. Those type of questions are a lot more um, higher level than just asking yes, no questions. Jump in and help wherever needed. Stay calm. One of the things that we've learned too with behavioral needs is that when something's going on behaviorally, our top priority is to let the lead take that child um, and do what they need to do, whether it's walk out of the room, whatever. We just support them in that so that they're the one building the relationship and that they are their safe place. If the teacher is getting interrupted repeatedly, meaning you've got kids that are distracted or somebody can't see it or any of those things, you help make sure that they're getting the instructional time in that they need. Um, triple check that cleaning and organization is done. That is the first priority of any aid or assistant. So we say classroom rules, but what we really mean is classroom commitments. They're not rules. The number one part of what we've learned is that our job as the adult is to keep them safe. The student's job, the child's job, is to help keep our classroom safe. What conscious discipline does is have things like looking eyes and listening ears and helping hands and walking feet and all these positive statements. 
And every day during the morning group time for the kids that are old enough, threes and fours primarily, a child will commit to what they're going to do to keep the classroom safe that day. So they are committing to having walking feet. That's a big one right now with the first year school. Our friends have forgotten what walking feet are. So they're going to commit to having walking feet. Now, we also go back to everything must be teaching. So we can't give consequences right now if they're not using walking feet. Because the first three days, we learn really quick, they don't know what walking feet are at all. You have to take a child by the hand and practice multiple times. These are walking feet. Walking feet keep us safe. When we use walking feet, we don't fall and hurt ourselves or run into friends or any of those things. So they have to be taught the how and why and what we do before consequences. Consequences come way later. So we've talked a little about this, but think about your behavior as well. If we tell the kids to have helping hands, then they need to see you having helping hands, helping the teacher do their things. If we tell the, the children that we don't roll around on the carpet, then when you sit on the carpet, you need to sit like the children sit or sit in a chair if you can't sit on the floor. Um, we ask the children, um, we tell the children that we sit in chairs or we sit on the floor. We don't sit on furniture. Furniture is for storing our, our toys and items. That means you don't need to be sitting on the furniture at all if there's a child around. Absolutely not. So everyone within our school should think of every moment as a teacher. And I'll be saying that over and over and over again. But we should have realistic expectations. What can the children do developmentally at that age? We've got some kids right now who are not up to the same developmental letter, level as their peers. So we have to keep the safety things first and then the other expectations can follow. So that means <clears throat> that the safety item would be we have walking feet in class. We have kind hands. That means that we're not going to be able to throw blocks and we are not going to be able to run in the classroom. But does that mean that they have to sit down during circle time? No, don't fight it right now. Um, talk about the basics and get the basics done and the basics practice first and then do the other things. Negotiable, non-negotiable. Safety is always non-negotiable. <clears throat> Again, we're teachers. We make sure we have clear, realistic, simple um, limits for our kids and make sure they have a private space to calm down and talk about expectations. We have got to really work on, as educators, hollering across the classroom, ah, fine, I see you, no, no, no. Um, we should be saying, going to the child directly, holding their hands and saying, I need you to use walking feet. Practice walking feet with me right now. And then move on. Um, that is the modeling that has to happen right now because all these kids, so many of our kids are new this year. We have to model appropriate behaviors. They don't know or understand. We have to be preventative with what we're doing. Um, <clears throat> example, right now, while we're waiting on this big, new, beautiful playground to be built, we don't have a lot of mulch and we've got dirt that's coming through. So be preventative in that. Maybe we need to take up the cups and the digging items and the sand tools that are out there and put them up for now because it's a problem. The dirt is a problem. Maybe we need to make sure before we go outside, we tell them, you may go slide, you may go play on the structure, you may do this, but dirt is off limits. Um, teaching and replacement skills. If they come up to a center that's already full with two children, then are you showing them, okay, there are two people in this, this center. Let's go check the other centers and count how many friends are there. Because that concrete knowing one and two, every kid doesn't have that yet. So you can't expect them to automatically understand there are two friends here. There are two friends here. There are two friends here. They may not get that yet. So make sure they understand the whole concept of things. The same thing goes with conflict re resolution, problem solving. We'll get into that, some of the conscious discipline. There's some great things to read over on how to script some of that. Logical and natural, natural consequences. That comes later. That is not right now. Um, consequences are one of those things that have to happen way after everything's been taught. Right now, our kids are not ready for consequences. There's a lot of steps and processes that have to happen before we move on to consequences. Playground rules. Make sure they potty before they go outside. Um, and when we're talking about potty breaks, one of the things that we've really changed in here, there is zero sitting waiting to go to the bathroom. 
children now work with your lead teacher. They should be playing in centers or doing something active, and you pull one or two at a time to go potty. There is no more sitting, waiting, wasted time. That is when your problems happen and you are creating problems for yourself with that type of classroom management. Make sure kids are constantly engaged and interacting and let them go back to the center. And then when everyone has potty, then you do your cleanup time. But keeping kids safe, classroom indoors, classroom outdoors, number one priority. We go outside two hours a day. That's not optional. That's licensure. You are also required to have fun and play. There will be no more sitting on the steps when we go outside. You may go out, be different locations across the playground. There are benches out there. Save those for my older teachers that need a break. You 20-somethings need to be up playing, having a good time. Um, make sure you're moving around the playground. If you have some behavior problems and some, some kids that can't quite get engaged and understand how to play and work with their friends, add some games, play tag, play chase, uh, Red Rover, all these things. Um, they really love. We have some tables out there so you can take center games outside to play with them. Another problem, make sure when before we come in, you've got a playground checker. That's a great job for a friend. And you're going around making sure everything in the playground is put back where it goes. Personal cell phones are never, ever, ever allowed <clears throat> on the playground by anyone um, at all. We're super visual to the world. Make sure we're setting a fantastic example. So behavior concerns, and you're going to have them, natural part of this, this world. Make sure you're the teacher first. Make sure your expectations that you have taught that child exactly what to do the 2,000 times it requires to make that brain fire and what it's supposed to be doing. Um, make sure you're teaching. Everything that you do should be teaching. Treat little ones with respect. Talk to them as if they're most important, special little people in the world. Build the relationship. Build the connection. All that has to happen first or they're not going to listen to what you're saying at all. Um, we do need to be direct and consistent with what we say. We need to be firm but kind at the same time. These are still babies. They haven't been in the world five years. They don't know what to do yet. It's our job to teach and show them. The kid's out of control. It's going to happen. We're going to go into some of this later with conscious discipline. There's a bunch of things we learned. I'm looking up the brain state model while I'm thinking about this, but there's different levels and different control parts of the brain. If a kid is down here in the bottom level, out of control, in that flight, fight, survival mode, they're not going to put those materials up. They are going to flip the tables and throw stuff and all that, and you just chill. There's nothing you can do about it when they're that dysregulated. Um, if you were a parent and you said, I'm fixing to spank your booty, um, that's engaging that same part of the brain with fear. And we can't do that here. And we're not going to do that here. So if a kid's out of control, we have different steps that we walk through. Um, one of them is allowing the lead to take them out um, of the classroom to calm himself. We have different common spaces in the room. But the biggest thing is giving them the space and the tools that they need to learn how to calm. That's really all we're doing right now. Um, if a kid's out of control, again, there's no cleaning up in that moment. There's no, um, there's no making them come back and pick up the chair that they just threw. It's not going to happen. Um, there are different steps, like I said, to get that child back in control. We will never, ever, ever threaten to lay a hand on the child or say, "Yo, mama or daddy are going to come up here. I'm going to get them to, to pop your butt. I've had enough. But you can't do that. That's not legal. We don't allow it. We can't threaten it. We can't. Um, we're mandated reporters if somebody else is doing it. It's not allowed. Um, there's all this research out there, and I keep saying research, but it's the truth. There's all this brain-based research that talks about when kids are using that fear portion of their brain or they are in that survival state, they just need safety. They don't need a lecture. They don't need um, fear, a consequence. They just need to know they are safe, they are loved, they are respected. Get them through that, and then we go back and have the teachable moment. Um, if you get frustrated, which can also happen, we all have these difficult kids that we're just like, I don't know what to do anymore. And if we get to that threatened state and we don't feel safe, then we're not at our genius level either. So make sure we can step away, find somebody else who is more regulated to get to that, that point if they get frustrated. 
if we have specific child concerns, we are going to keep all the children safe first above all else. Always help shadow that child with questionable behaviors. We've got several right now. Help keep them engaged. Help keep them focused on the task at hand. Um, look for the root cause of the problem. Make sure you have empathy and positive intent. Positive intent is something that we've learned a lot about with conscious discipline. That's going into the classroom and instead of seeing that kid throwing the paper all off the table, giving it positive intent and saying, wow, you seem frustrated. Was it a problem with your artwork or were you upset that there was another friend at the table? How can I help? And we're not looking at it as, oh my God, you got to clean this up. You can't do that. But no, like go to the child, figure out the problem and help them navigate it. That's what we are. We are navigators. We are teachers first and foremost. There's always going to be some root of the problem. A lot of the kids right now we see have sensory issues. You're not going to scare that out of them with consequences. Not going to happen. A child with autism is not going to be um, dealt fear as a way to maintain what's going on with their emotional senses. It's just not going to happen. Um, same thing with the kid that doesn't feel safe because mom and dad are divorced and they are fighting against each other. That kid doesn't feel safe. They're not going to do what you want just because you say so. It doesn't work that way. Um, work with the classroom teacher, director, support personnel. Everyone has to be on the same page when it comes to a specific child. We do have to hold them accountable for non-negotiables that are our safety concerns. Walking feet. Every child can have walking feet. We currently do not have any children that should have a problem with that because of a developmental delay. We cannot ever, even if you've been trained in this, use any kind of constraint holds. That's not the type of center we are. We are not ABA. Those are not allowed. Um, lead teacher is the one that we are in enabling with the power to remove the child from the classroom. An assistant or an aide does not need to do that. Even me as the director does not. That child, that student needs to build that relationship and that rapport with the lead teacher first. And then we assist with everything else going on in the classroom. Um, now, if that lead teacher needs help and assistance, then I will step in. Um, but first and foremost, we need to support the lead and what they're trying to do with the child. Always try to redirect, reoccupy. Um, sometimes we use electronics for that. If it's a child with an IEP or a plan where we know, okay, they're getting to the point of dysregulation, we got to bring them back down. We got to calm them so we can work through these things. Also, make sure that we're telling somebody. We've had problems over the years of, no one's documenting. We're not taking photos, making notes, making incident reports. Every bit of that's important. Um, a lot of times, even in the beginning, especially this time in the school year, we will make and document incident reports that they're not going home to the family just yet. If a kid's a runner, if a kid is eloping, let's say, we've got one right now that likes to, to run away. Um, we're still trying to figure that kid out. Are we documenting it? Absolutely. Because in a few weeks, we're going to need to talk to the family about this. And we're going to need to say, this child is um, running away during the day. We've pinpointed it. It's to transition times when they don't want to transition. Do you have this problem at home? Have you ever thought about having the autism screening done? Um, there's different things that we need to go through with the process, but we've got to be able to document it all first. We talked about this. An unregulated child is not going to make safe choices. They're not going to clean up. They're not going to do what we want them to do. And the more we learn about the brain, the more we learn about brain state, the more we know you got to get them from fight, flight, flee, I'm not safe, help, 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 to being that brilliant kid that they really are. And to do that, you have to get them through that um, dysregulation first. So, that takes a lot of patience and a lot of time and a lot of requirements. But um, when you figure out how to take the fear out of it, and I'm not saying take the, the expectations out. Expectations most certainly have to stay. But the fear portion of that has got to go. When we, we do that, the brain isn't, isn't functioning properly anymore. So these are prohibited behaviors that we are required by licensure to talk about. We're not allowed to have corporal punishment. Um, these should be well known. Just read through this. Emotional punishment, um, rejection, terrorizing, ignoring, isolating, all those things that cause fear that we're not supposed to be doing anyway, none of that can happen. You can't humiliate them. You can't threaten physical punishment. You can't 
um, use time out. You can't isolate. You can't put them in a locked room, a closet. They can't be separated from staff in any way. Um, they can't have psychological abuse. We can't say you're not eating snacks. We can't say um, you're not going to get to play outside. We can't say, well, I'm not taking you to the bathroom. Every bit of that is not legal in the state of Mississippi. So just be very specific and very careful on what you say and what you do, because these will all um, be immediately documented. Um, they are reportable offenses. So we do um, have some more that um, no child spends ever physically restrained. We are not going to, well, we don't even use things like high chairs or um, play pens or any of that, but no kid can ever be physically restrained for any reason. Um, again, there is no child that's going to get disciplined for not sleeping at nap time. They can lay on their cots and you can have high expectations and you should have high expectations. Um, but we're not um, going to punish or have consequences for those kind of things. Um, in being in compliant, that child not coming to the rug when you want them to, that is not a reason for a consequence in that moment in time. Especially at this point in the semester when we are just safety, safety, safety. We'll figure all that out later, but that's not, that's not how um, discipline or consequences are meant to be told out. So really be thinking about um, how you're going to work and move throughout the classroom without using any of this discipline type things. Now, we use and will continue to use what's called conscious discipline, where we're giving them the words and the tools of what they need of how to interact and behave and keep themselves safe and keep our classroom safe. But that's different. We want them consciously to make their own choice and decision about being safe. And that's just something they need for the rest of their life. So your tone absolutely matters. If you come to a kid with a tone of fear, you're not going to last here. We're not going to allow that. Go to the child. Don't yell at the child. Don't go yelling across the classroom in the playground. Run to the child and talk to them about it. Again, we are mandated reporters and um, we definitely have a reporting policy here. If it's on a staff member and you feel uncomfortable, you can go upstairs to Karen Partain and talk to her. Otherwise, um, you may talk to me about it. I am always going to defer to talking you through it and seeing was it something that's reportable or was it something that's a concern. And sometimes the lines blur on that. And if they do, I'm going to tell you to report. I'm never going to tell you not to report if that's what your, your gut is saying to do. So. Just please be aware of all these things. Um, and mandated reporting goes both ways. It could be on staff. It could be on a parent. It could be that they showed up with marks. Um, all those type of things, we are, again, here to keep our kids safe, first and foremost. So why do we have behavior problems in the classroom? Well, right now, first of the year, we have behavior problems because they are new. They, we were calling our little green beans yesterday because they are green as I'll get out. They don't know the rules. The rules can't be enforced. The rules can't be followed because they don't have the practice to do it yet. Um, rules have to be clear. Our safety plans have to be followed. They have to be enforced and we have to remind. Um, and eventually, maybe even the parents have to be involved. We're seeing a lot, again, of um, children that have not been in group care. So, um, the parents have to be reminded here, we're going to sit down at the table and eat together. If you're letting your kid wander and come back to the table to eat, they're not going to um, have the skills they need to sit with their friends. So we all need to practice. <clears throat> Triple check with me, the instructor, the lead, whoever that might be, that our expectations are appropriate for the child, that we don't have developmental concerns and that we are doing what we need to do. Um, routines must be consistent. Consistency definitely matters. We need to make sure that the games and activities must be engaging or the kids aren't going to stay in centers. Kids and their major life disruptions. This age is massive for children having divorce, moving, new jobs, parents working different hours, new babies. Every bit of that is going to disrupt what they're doing in their life. Um, a lot of our kids and a lot of our friends need a lot of movement. Little kids aren't made to sit still. Make sure what we're doing plays into that and they're able to get the movement that their little bodies need. So something else developmentally, impulse and behavior control, it ain't developed at one, two, three, four, even five. Their brains are still growing. We know this. We know that their brains are still growing. So make sure that what we're asking them to do is developmentally appropriate. And if it is developmentally appropriate, and we know that they should be able to handle this behaviorally, 
are we documenting it so that we can start an intervention plan? We waited too late last year on some of our children with starting intervention plans and having those difficult conversations, and we're not doing that again. Um, we are going to take this first four weeks, six weeks, whatever, first little quarter, and really document and let the kids settle into a plan, let them kind of settle into our school environment, and then revisit it. But right now is when we need to be sticking to routines and plans so that we know what's really a developmental problem or what's really a behavioral concern that needs more intervention or what's just they're getting used to it and they just haven't had enough exposure yet. Those are two different things. So if something happened, <clears throat> what do we do? The biggest thing morning, afternoon, whenever, is that you need to get the director or director designee. My hours are generally 6.30 to 2.30. Um, I work my eight hours early in the morning before everybody gets here sometimes to get my hours in just because it gets so crazy once people are here. Yeah. But in the afternoons, you need to get a director designee. That's going to be Bobby or Cherie. In the mornings, you can get me or um, Miss Beth, Bobby or Cherie as well. Um, make sure you get them and then they get to decide how and who gets notified and what we're, what is said. If it left a mark on a kid or a teacher, we have to tell the parents we have to do a report. Someone for, uh, trained in first aid must give medical care. We have to have incident accident reports. We'll go into that later. We post an image of the incident accident report into Brightwell so the parents see it. If it's something that happens to a child, like we had a busted lip today, um, we'll take a picture of the kid and send it to the parents. Um, have the family sign the report at the end of the day. If the incident happened in the morning, this is something we ran into last year that we're trying to get a little more specific on how to help. And let's say um, Matthew's going to the door to talk to the family and we get the family to sign. Oh, yes, ma'am. I'm not really exactly certain what happened. I was not here during that time, but I'll let their teacher know to make sure we find time to talk to you about it in the morning first thing. Um, that way you're not making up and coming up with stories or excuses or any of that. It should be very cut and dry. Put them back to the lead teacher. If it's that important to them, say, okay, I'll message them now with your phone number. And if they're available, they can talk to you now. Um, but don't try to feed into that, make up things or, well, little, little, um, John Davis had problems. He's been kicking his friends all week long. Don't, don't get into all that because you don't know the whole story about what's going on. If an injury goes to the doctor, this is when it gets very, very specific and detailed. We have to have a full report. Everyone who witnessed it, any teachers, staff here have to do a report. It's gotta be typed, written, signed, documented, scanned into the system, sent to, um, sent to licensure within 12 hours. Um, so, please, please, please make sure we get all that documented. Um, we talk a lot about this semester. Um, parents never get good reports. Anyone in the afternoon, again, be very conscious of your wording and saying things like, oh, I know they had fun on the playground. I'm not sure how the morning went. You don't know. You weren't here. Don't try to say they had a great day. Don't say that. Um, be very specific in what you say in a positive manner. Um, only the lead teacher or the director or director designee should be saying anything of any concerning nature to the family, not student workers ever whatsoever at all. So we do check temps multiple times a day, especially when we know we've got COVID or flu or strep or any of that coming through. Um, make sure if you're checking temps, you document it in Brightwell. A fever um, temporarily is 100 degrees. Um, we check also under the arm. We always make sure we're following up with an underarm temperature and make sure we're documenting any behavioral changes. So let's say um, little John David got very upset um, after nap time and he's just not been well and not been himself all afternoon. We need to let parents know that because they could be getting sick. The same thing goes for stomach upset. Um, if they have three more episodes in 24 hour period or if they are in diapers and it cannot be contained within the diapers. I got to go home. Vomiting, we do two, two or more times. And that's because a lot of times with drainage and things, they may get sick, but they're really not sick. It's just the drainage is making them um, get choked or whatnot. So we always, no teacher is ever, and I say lead teacher, lead teacher, um, staff, 
assistants, aides, student workers, whatever, should be sending a kid home before we've talked about it. Um, we need to make sure that we're all on the same page because what's going to happen, that mama's going to call the office and I'm not going to know anything about it. And that doesn't need to happen. We all need to stay on the same page with everything, whether it's behavior, sickness, whatever. <clears throat> so classroom responsibilities. We talked about the ratios. Anyone who is left alone with a child or comes in with a child must have a Mississippi letter of suitability. That is a non-negotiable on my part. Um, that is a licensure requirement. Yes, you've had background checks with MUW, but that doesn't count for the state of Mississippi with licensure. So one adult, and this goes through the numbers, the numbers are also posted on the door signs. Um, make sure you understand the ratios. Basic notes that are great for this group of children. Make sure counting kids constantly so you know you have everybody. A great way to do that is to keep the Brightwell app up on the iPad so that you can check, just do a visual count and a, a check with the, the kids just to make sure um, that every kid is present. Make sure you've got eyes on adults at all times. Something that <clears throat> Miss Mary, when she walks in a room, and we got some problems with this right now because we've got so many kids that need help in the bathroom. If we walk in a classroom and the lead teacher or the person who's supposed to be supervising is just in the bathroom with the kids and nobody's supervising the other kids, well, guess what happens? You have a one-to-one -one teacher ratio, and now I have 13 kids that are not being supervised, and I just get wrote up for 13 kids. So what would I rather you do? Spend the time with the 13, and the one in the bathroom can wait a few minutes until you get some backup and assistance or until they really need you. Um, we've got to figure this out so that the, the kids, the larger group of kids are the ones that are being monitored and safe at all times. Um, watch nicknames. Make sure we're using given names. Some of those are just not helpful or um, responsive to what the family needs. Follow the rules by the lead teacher. We've been talking about that. We've all got the same commitments throughout the center this year. We've got the same chants. We've got the same songs. Um, that should be easy and for callbacks and things like that in the classroom. Every kid should make sure we're cleaning their centers before moving to, the, to a different center. The only group that shouldn't really be worried about this right now is Riri. Her babies are too little. Now, Bob got some old ones that are old enough, and Kamika, all these other classes should definitely be making sure um, we are working in our centers, cleaning it up, then moving on. We're going to work on getting some tags and things like that so we can make that happen. Pre-K kids need to write their name on all their artwork. Um, again, about bathroom transitions, don't waste class time. There is zero sitting at a table waiting to go potty. Um, those not going to happen. <clears throat> Check with your classroom lead on diapering. Um, you're supposed to be helping and assisting with personal care. Uh, follow up with the littles in the bathroom. Make sure they can wipe. Make sure they know how to ask to wipe. That's a huge thing. And communicate with the lead teacher. So we are USDA food reimbursement program. So we do the two bite club. We ask that all kids try two items before seconds. Now we have kids with sensory issues. We're going to be a little more cognizant of that. But for the most part, our kids can try two bites before getting seconds on anything. We have all kids sit down at tables for meals. We serve them once. The lead teachers and the teaching staff serves themselves. We all sit down to eat. And after the teacher has eaten, then we can um, go back and get seconds. But we practice conversations, family style at the table. We have to allow a certain time to eat, a certain amount of time. So make sure you're checking and watching your schedule on that. Adults have to eat what the children eat. You are not allowed to eat anything but what is uh, brought in by USDA. <clears throat> Encourage patience and conversation and waiting. And of course, first priority is feeding the kids. That means if it's a day where we don't have a lot of food, um, feed the kids first, teach your staff later. We will assign snack help in the afternoon. We'll need snack help every day and help in the kitchen on Fridays. Typically, we have someone who's a culinary major that can help us with that, and that should help settle in as we get throughout the semester. You only need two components of snack. Typically, for us, that's, that's a milk and a cracker-based item of some kind. Um, adults are not allowed to go in the kitchen and get food unless it's come out at mealtime. We're just going through so many snacks. We think we've got people going in and getting snacks when they're not supposed to. <clears throat> the leads, of course, set the tone for the class. They're responsible for all the communication. 
Um, they have to have the lesson plan to me by Thursday. They have to have the lesson plan posted to parents and sent out by Monday. They have to plan afternoon activities for um, the lead assistants who are there in the afternoons. They set the learning and the routine of the class. They have to work on delegating and supervising. This is something that we really need to work on. And I'm going to be honest, sometimes, especially this time of year, our leads, me, myself, all of us, have our thoughts so set and focused on meeting the children's needs that we don't always focus on the assistants and aides. We need the aides and assistants and work study students to step up and take this, what we're saying, and go back into those classrooms and ask questions on how you can help. Um, the leads are the ones that update families with photos. The biggest thing I can say about that is we use Brightwell for everything. Love some Brightwell. But if you're in the classroom and you see a teacher doing some great activities over with the child, take those pictures. Um, take those pictures to help. And we say this here. We need everyone's help with that. That means checking in and out, updating photos, doc documenting the meals, diapering, all that. Make sure to take pictures and send family all the notes that they're required. Any technology, got to be part of the lesson plan. And I goof on this sometimes, too. I'll come through and say, oh, it's a little crazy. Let's read a book online. Well, we're not supposed to do that. Um, there are some things that if they're studying Little Red Hen and they want to do a Little Red Hen short story, make sure you discuss it with the lead teacher. Um, the biggest thing, and I failed on this yesterday, y'all. We, we are all learning here. If it's the end of the day, don't put on any technology um, because same thing happened yesterday. A new parent walked in. When we're reading a story. We're, we're doing something that I know is fine. I'm probably the only one in that room that realizes what we're doing. I didn't think about it. So make sure that we're doing it at appropriate times. I would rather if you're going to have to do that, do something for them to calm down and do, you know, like we're saying Little Red Hen while they're doing Little Red Hen Fable. Um, make sure it's make at a spot that makes sense and make sure it's approved by the teacher. You talk to it about the teacher. Um, we're really working on some of the things, not using things to hype them up, use things to calm them down. So like when we're coming in from outdoor play, um, outside on the playground in the morning, we're coming in and doing yoga or we're doing a book on tape or something like that. Um, some of the indoor recess things are fine for days like today where it's rainy. But for the most part, a lot of what we're using technology for now is the calming for yoga and things like that. Um, we got some kids right now that are plenty hyped up, so we don't necessarily have to have indoor recess or dance parties all the time. There are specific times that those make sense, but they don't make sense all the time. Um, again, no phones in the classrooms. Brightwell is used, group me is used, walkie-talkies for communication. We have iPads in all the rooms that are used. We also have walkies, so there's no need to have a cell phone. Okay, this is somehow really, really hard for a lot of our student workers or people who have not majored in early childhood to understand. Workbooks and worksheets are not developmentally appropriate for any age of child up to about age eight, honestly. Don't tell them in public schools they won't listen. But we are a play-based philosophy center. We believe in Maria Montessori. Um, we believe that kids are learning through play. <clears throat> so we have to figure out how to teach it through play-based activities. And your job coming in as a student worker is to go to the lead and say, what are we learning this week in the centers? How can I help you support that? Um, just a parent tidbit, if your kid later on in life is coming home with photocopied worksheets, coloring book pages, all that, um, the teachers haven't studied early childhood or the school itself is feeling pressure that parents view it as formal learning. It's not. There is all this brain research out there that a worksheet itself, like if you give them a worksheet to fill out, they remember like 10%. It's something low. I don't remember the exact numbers. But if you make it hands-on and it activates all these parts of the brain and the sensory, the fingers, you're using movement, you're using taste, you're using um, listening and all the, the tactile things, then they're actually able to remember 90% of the stuff that they're learning compared to a 10% worksheet. So don't use worksheets, don't do coloring sheets. There are other ways for them to learn fine motor skills, gross motor skills. Um, using manipulatives in play, there's way better things to do than worksheets. Leave them out of this center. <clears throat> so we're going to quickly go kind of through some of the morning to do, but I'm going to leave this in the binder. I'm just going to spot check this. Um, biggest thing in the morning when you come in, make sure we're helping parents and you too check in and out of Brightwheel. 
Make sure we're documenting everything to the parents. Make sure you are assigned to a center to help or your job is rotating through the classrooms or your job is working the bathroom. Your job is for sure helping with breakfast, cleaning up after breakfast, uh, sweeping, wiping up the floor, all that. The lead teacher should not be doing those things. Um, some of our teachers have um, worked hard to get where they are and they need you to support them in that so they can make sure they're doing the instructional time they are here to do. <clears throat> Bleach solution has to be washed day, mixed daily. That's something we're doing in the morning. And again, hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. Nap time. Again, we need you to help monitor Brightwell, make sure meals are in, naps are in, all that. Lead teachers should be able to leave the room at nap time to go take their break or uh, work on lesson plans and all those things. Um, we need you as a student worker to be prepared to stay and watch what they're doing at nap time. <clears throat> So clean routines should definitely happen at nap time. Each room has got a specific schedule of days to clean. Really what that means is wiping down all surfaces should happen first. That's chairs, tables, all those things on the floor. Make sure those are wiped down and clean before or after every meal. Then comes actual items. If you're in the little room and they put it in their mouth, it immediately goes to the wash bucket. But other than that, we have certain days that we really wipe down and clean off the shelves for Art Center. Or we really wipe down and clean the items that are in home living. This is a lot more in the ones and twos than it is in the threes and fours, but because we have such new friends this year and we're going to have a lot of new germ sharing, um, we really need to make sure we're doing our part to clean. We um, don't allow them to use pillows or stuffies. They have to use what they brought in for nap mats. Um, verify nap time classroom rules. Most of us allow one time to get up and then um, they have to stay on their cot. Something that works better than sitting by one child now, the ones and twos are different, especially with the littles. A lot of times we're, they're, they're still sleeping in cribs at night, so they need a lot of help and assistance with backpacks or um, cuddles or whatever to get to lay down. But by the time they get to the threes and fours or even the, the twos, the person um, that is working in there at nap time should be walking around the room, standing, sitting, whatever, beside a child if needed. But the best thing is to walk around the room, get everyone settled as much as possible. There's no talking. We lay still like statues. We play our rest music in the background and we're rotating around the room, kind of walking around till the kids settle down. Then those last one or two, then pull up your chair and sit beside that child. Um, but get the bulk of your kids down first and then worry about the ones or two that are that are harder to get to rest. Um, again, there's no punishment for not, not napping. Um, they do have to lay quietly and still. That is our rule. Um, and right now we do have all kids that can pretty much do that. So <clears throat> afternoon to do, please, please, please make sure you're checking their faces, their hands, all that good stuff for cleanliness. Um, you had a parent pickup yesterday, lots of Lots of congestion coming out the nose. Make sure their faces are clean. To a parent, that's what it looks like if you've cared for their child all day. Is their face clean? Are they clean? Are they dry? <laughs> that's what they want to know. Um, if you don't know the pickup person, ask and verify. Make sure you're checking in Brightwell. Make sure a lead benefited director, director designee, someone is checking on that person before you give a kid to a grown-up. Um, we have several kids and, and families in here that do not have um, very amicable agreements on custodial things. So we need to be very careful and diligent on making sure that kids are going home with the right people. Again, make sure clean, uh, rooms are cleaner than you found it. Walking through just yesterday, just kind of realizing we don't have a lot of support right now and making sure that the tables are wiped down, chairs are wiped down, chairs are put up so Miss Mary can spot mop in the morning. Um, chairs should be on tables at the end of the day, so Miss Mary can spot mop and vacuum. All the tops of um, the cabinets should be wiped down because kids have been putting their dirty fingers or um, you might have poured your milk out there during um, fixing things for snack or whatever. All those surfaces, those top surfaces need to be cleaned before you walk out of that room. Um, make sure both playgrounds are neat and tidy. All the doors and gates are locked. And one of the leads in the ones and twos will be your director designee. So it'll either be Bobby or Sheree in the afternoon. Make sure before you walk out, the heater air is on. You're verifying that every food, the only garbage we have to take out in the afternoon is food or diaper. Um, everything else paper-wise can stay. But check the disinfectant list that's also in your binder. 
um, make sure all the doors again are locked, turn out all the lights, all the toilets are flushed, check the attendance and bright wheel one last time before you leave to make sure everybody's gone. This is super important. If there's still a kid here at 525, and it could be every day, you need to be messaging that family saying it's 525 and John David is still here. We walk out the door at 530. Where are you? <laughs> because otherwise, parents are not going to get the message and they'll take advantage of it. Make sure, make sure, make sure every day you're messaging, texting, whatever you got to do, even if it's the same kid. 525, send that message. <clears throat> Absences. If you're going to be absent, you have to let me know. Group me. If you don't get a response, my text number will also be in the binder. Um, if you're going to be out, you are responsible for finding your replacement, not me. That means if you are covering for someone at nap time, it's your snack duty day or it's your Friday kitchen day, you need to make sure you have a replacement and have told someone. That's not on me. You can work with any of our lead um, staff, our student staff, um, to figure that out and figure out how to work that. We depend on everybody. Again, I've said this multiple times, make sure your drinks are in this, not in your pretty Starbucks cup. No McDonald's, none of that. So get paid. That's important. Huh? <clears throat> Time cards are on the computer in the CPDC library. You have to do it and make sure it's complete every Thursday. Every two weeks um, on that Thursday, you're going to print and sign, and I send it and have it done on Fridays. So... Every Thursday, there will be one week where you'll just make sure you're caught up on your time. <clears throat> and then the next Thursday, every two weeks, you'll be printing and signing it and putting it into our white bucket. That'll be out there. Make sure you put what classroom you're in just in case we get some COVID cases. Um, and this is super important. I will not chase you down. If you do not want to be paid and you do not turn in your card, that's on you. I'm going to assume your time was voluntary. Um, we have way too many kids that come in for volunteer hours for observation hours, student teaching, all these things for me to try to determine and keep up with who's here doing voluntary hours or who wants to get paid. That's on you. Um, we have a lot of students, let's say, who are working for Jumpstart, and then they're wanting to get in the sorority, and then they're also working um, for residence life. So that means I might only be able to work 10 hours. But because they're trying to get all these voluntary hours, they might actually be here 20, 30 hours a week because they need the time. I'm not going to keep up with that for you. That's on you. Um, I'm not chasing anyone down for that. Um, so we have absences, and we've talked about that, and then the must do. So everyone who is here has to have a one over 120 hours. It's got to have the letter of suitability. You've got to have an application filled out. You have to have a Mississippi 121 immunization form. If you don't have that, you can get that from the uh, campus um, health center. You have to have an MUW background check and we have to um, have a letter of suitability for employment. The first aid CPR training, if you're benefited, you have to have that within 30 days. And then um, we also are requiring everyone to have a minimum of 15 hours a year of training in early childhood, 30 hours for benefited position, but usually we hit 150 hours. So all benefited positions, um, must be a director designee. So we've got some right now that we're working on that are going to have to be able to turn in and get director designee uh, requirements, but we'll take care of that soon. Again, this is a real job. This is a legit job with actual responsibilities. Cell phones and personal property um, must be put up. Um, phones are not allowed on classroom playgrounds. Absences, you got to let me know ahead of time. No shows are not tolerated. Because of COVID, we had not been doing a lot of write-ups the past um, two years. We, It's been rough. It has been a hard two years. So <clears throat> one of the biggest things that student workers have been very diligent in telling me, and I completely agree, is that when you've got somebody who's doing the right thing, and this, this is for all staff, leads, everyone. When you've got someone who's doing it right, and they're showing up, and they're always here, and they're they're, you know, punching through and doing a great job. It wears on them when there's people not doing what they're supposed to be doing and those people never get in trouble. This year, we'll be going back to a write-up system. We've got a lot of people on staff. If it's not for you, it's not for you. My first job, my first foremost job is to keep my happy, excited, fantastic workers happy, excited, and fantastic. And if someone being negative pulls that down, we don't need you. 
Um, we will absolutely pour into you and motivate and help you um, get better if that's what you want to do. But if it's not what you want to do, don't stay. We um, don't allow no-shows because we depend on you. Make sure we're a team here. We're a family here. We depend on you. Um, we depend on everyone here. Our teachers love student workers. They help our lives make them so much easier, and we need you. But we need you to be awesome. <clears throat> so, that being said, welcome to the CPDC's family, and we are so glad you're going on this journey with us, and we can't wait to get started soon. Have fun. <laughs>